Okay, hopefully those of you online can hear me. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I apologize ahead of time. I'm on my third daycare associated viral illness. It's not COVID because I already had COVID three weeks ago as well. Um, and so I'm a little bit snotty and I'm a little bit coffee. I'm just going to leave my mask on so I don't infect all of the fellows in the program. <laughs> Um, but it might make me a little bit muted. So I'm going to talk about derm. There's going to be a lot of pictures. Those of you who schlepped in here in person can get some candy if you answer some questions properly. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat too, so anyone wants to enter the chat, but we'll kind of go from there. So I'm Stephanie. I'm one of the PGY6 EMIM crits. I'm getting ready to graduate and call this the last lecture. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the dermatologies that you can see in the ICU. Um, I broadened it a little bit because I think most of us can think of like two ICU actual dermatologic emergencies, but um, expanded it a little bit to also include some of the things that are rashes associated with ICU diagnoses. And so we'll kind of play a little bit of rapid fire derm at the end here. So, I think it helps to start by having a common ground with our dermatologist when we start talking about rashes. Um, I know I personally tend to call everything a maculopapular rash, even though that's a very specific thing that describes a lot of rashes, but doesn't necessarily describe the rash that you're calling them about. Um, when we talk about describing rashes, the first question is whether or not it's a flat or if it's raised, and then if it is raised, whether or not that is filled with fluid or it's solid. If it is filled with fluid, whether or not that fluid is a clear fluid or if it's um, purulent. And then if it's a solid mass, how deep the mass goes. And then because nothing can be simple, once you have a thing, it will be called something different if it's big or small. This is a really quick, easy, thank you, um, kind of diagram that helps walk you through describing things. Um, so the, like I said, first question, if it's flat or not. So if it's flat, it's either a macula or a patch, and it depends on what size it is. The cutoff is one centimeter or about the end of a pencil. Um, if it's small, it's a macula. If it's big, it's a patch. If it's not flat, then it is presumably elevated, in which case you then ask, is it solid or not? If it is solid, um, you talk about depth. So if it is solid and superficial, it is a nodule, and then if, or sorry, if it's solid and superficial, it can be either a papule or a plaque, depending on how deep it is. If it is solid and deep, it's a nodule. Um, if it comes and goes, it's a wheel. And then if it is solid but full of fluid, the question is what size, or, or is that fluid clear or is it purulent, basically. If it's purulent, it's postule. If it's clear, it's either a vesicle or a bulla. And that, again, depends on size with a centimeter being the cutoff. So flat lesions, macules, less than a centimeter. Some examples are moles, freckles, um, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So when you pick your zit and then you get the, the pigmentation afterwards, that's what it is. Um, tinea will also look like this. And melanomas, if they're not extending above the sin, can be macules. And patches are just bigger versions of that. Big moles, something like vitiligo is patch. Um, and then erythema migrans can be a patch. Fluidvilles, pustules are filled with pus, hence the name. Um, pimples, folliculitis, varicella, chickenpox or sorry, smallpox are all pustules. And then if it's fluid filled, again, size is your distinguisher. Bulla are big, vesicles are small. Burns, scalded skin syndrome, SJS and 10, bullous pemphibogoid and other pemphibogoids. For solid things, depth matters. Um, deeper structures are usually considered greater than a half a centimeter deep. Things are like cysts, tumors, carcinomas. And then if it's more superficial than that, kind of like my little picture here, more superficial. Um, sizing is important, papule, papule, papule versus plaque. These tend to arise from the upper layers of the skin and dermis, things like acne, bacterial rashes like impetigo or scarlet fever, um, eczema, psoriasis, pityriasis are all examples of papules and plaques. So first chance for candy. we have this lovely rash, which is small, clear-filled lesions. Oh, 
And I also apologize for those sitting in the closer rows. If I hit you in the face, Dr. Olette, that's realistically you. <laughs> All right, anyone want to guess what best? Diagnosis. I don't like the microphone thing freaking out. This is varicella, chicken pox. All right. That we have large, slightly raised lesions. So patches are flat, but be raised. Yeah, and part of it will depend on how <laughs> diagnosis. This is a scary one that you you shouldn't ever hopefully see this rash, but we might. This is meningococcemia rash. All right, last one of these. Name the rash. It is small race bumps with some small flat. It is maculopapular. <laughs> <laughs> I can't throw. I knew that was going to happen. Okay. Anyone know what this is? None of you should have ever seen this. Measles. All right. So what does that have to do with us in the ICU? A lot of those rashes are ones we will hopefully never see, and some of them we will. Um, but some of the rashes can actually kill you. Um, this is the one study which, out of England, which looked at ICU admissions for about a two-year period in the early 2000s, found that 0.5% of all ICU admissions were rashes, which for them amounted to about two ICUs two admissions per ICU per year. And amongst those, there was a 25% mortality in the ICU and a 40% mortality during the hospitalization. Um, and many diseases have dermatologic manifestations that we tend to ignore, but A, will come up on boards and B, will actually see in person. Um, up to 10% of ICU patients will have some type of skin finding that you can see. So let's talk about some of the life-threatening rashes. So we have SJS10, which those of you who were in the MICU last month, I think it was, we had a patient who had it. Neck flash, pemphigus, toxic shock, staph, staph scalded sin, skin syndrome, which I cannot say to you me, um, and dress. And then these are some of the diseases that have rashes as a clue, allergic reactions, I think that's one we've all seen, serum sickness, meningococcemia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which we don't see a whole lot in Michigan, but as you get outside of Michigan, you'll start to see a lot more in the endemic areas. Um, Calciphylaxis with our gigantic ESRD population, and then cutaneous vasculitides. So some cases. Here we have a 25 year old female who came in, who has no past medical history, came in, wasn't feeling well, a little bit hot, a little bit nauseous, um, and had broken out in this rash the previous day. Vitals, she is febrile, hypotensive, tachycardic, and a little bit tachypnic. And her labs were remarkable for leukocytosis, some very mildly elevated LFTs. She has an AKI and an elevated CPK. And this is what her skin looks like. Anyone wanna make a guess? Staff's called it skin. I'm gonna give you candy, but oh, that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong candy, candy and ox shape there. Can you get this? Not quite, that one, that one will come. Um, some other clues is she's not pregnant. <laughs> toxic yeah. shock. Yeah, toxic shock. This is the rash of toxic shock. Um, so it initially starts looking like a sunburn, kind of like her face does in that picture. Um, and then it usually will involve the palms and soles. So when you talk about derm stuff, if it involves the palms and soles, it limits your diagnosis significantly because not a lot of rashes do palms and soles. 
um, it will then desquamate like her hand did in that picture. Um, it is caused by either staph or strep, um, and it's a toxin-mediated pathway that starts with T cells and results in a massive cytokine storm. Classically was associated with superabsorbent tampons in the 80s. It actually made them change how tampons were manufactured so that they are less absorbent now than they used to be because women would leave them in for too long and then they would get toxic shock. But it's not gone. You can still get it with today's tampons. Um, some other things is any staph or strep infection can actually cause it. So soft tissue infections, sinusitis. The other one that I've seen it in is nasal packing from an ENT thing. Then they left the nasal packing in and now they have toxic shock, pneumonia. It tends to be in younger populations who are having their first real big exposure to a staph or strep infection. So think 20s, 30s rather than 60s, 70s. Some of the symptoms that they'll have, really non-specific and non-helpful. They'll be febrile, maybe a little bit nauseous, maybe having some diarrhea. Um, but the two things that are pretty uh, apparent in almost every patient is the rash. Um, and then some of them will have that rash extending onto their mucosal surface and it will look like strawberry tongue. Um, typically though, it is diagnosed late because it's such a non-specific symptom and it's super easy to ignore that rash until it starts peeling off. Um, interestingly, up to 50% of neck rash cases are actually complicated by group A toxic shock. And like I said, there's a higher incidence in young people and in pregnancy. The big thing is as soon as you suspect it, you should start treating for it because it can rapidly be fatal and we diagnose it too late. So when you suspect it is anyone who has a sepsis-like illness with this kind of vague sunburn looking rash. Um, in younger patients that start with kind of the GI symptoms, they can rapidly decompensate. Sometimes they'll just present saying they feel nauseous and having some vomiting and then rapidly fall off the cliff. Um, other signs, if you have someone who has just like a tiny, you know, abscess on their arm that now is fluidly septic, um, and anyone who has a known group A strep infection. Treatment, so start big first until you get that bugs. This typically includes Vanco and a gram, broad spectrum gram positive coverage, either cefepime, zosin, or carbapenem, plus clindamycin. Linda will come up a couple of times in this lecture because it helps mediate or inhibit toxin production within the bacteria itself. So that when you then kill the bacteria, there's not a whole bunch of toxins spreading out into the system. Um, interestingly, mazelid also has some antitoxin properties and in some cases can be used as monotherapy. There is some literature that maybe IVIG once they're refractory might help, but I think that also tends to be a it's an immune overreaction, so let's dampen the immune system and try to remove some of these circulating antibodies, and IVIG comes up a lot as a refractory. All right, next one. I know this picture doesn't look like an 80-year-old, but assume it's an 80-year-old <laughs> um, who has a history of CKD, hypertension, and diabetes. Also presents with kind of vague symptoms, malaise, fever, rash, um, and he is much less sick. A little bit febrile, blood pressure's okay though, maybe a tiny bit sacrificial. <laughs> I told you I'm terrible at throwing. And Hershey kisses fly. So this is staph called the skin syndrome. It is also toxin mediated. Um, importantly, it spares the mucous membranes, which will differentiate it from something else we've got coming up in the future. You notice on this kiddo, um, his lips, although there's crusting around them, the lips themselves are not involved. Um, it starts as redness that kind of starts in the skin folds, usually the axilla and groin, and then spreads first centripetally and then to the periphery. Um, and it, prog it progresses from that kind of just mild erythema to your big bulla that are Nikolsky positive. And what the Nikolsky sign is, is if you just gently nudge the edge of the bulla, the whole skin will slough off. What it means is that it's a superficial bulla rather than a deep one. Um, which will can help you diagnose between something like bolus pemphigus and pemphigoid vulgaris, which I still can't say in the order that they actually go in most of them. Um, the patients look terrible because all of their skin, the superficial layer of their skin is sloughing off, but they're actually usually pretty okay. There tends to be a very bimodal age of distribution. The reason that that picture is of a kid is because it's mostly seen in kids. Um, but over the age of 80 tends to have a recurrence and it tends to be an immunocompromised patients or patients with kidney dysfunction. Hence why our patients with CKD. Admission, they, go, they get admitted because they have a lot of fluid losses. Um, you wanna give them a staph 
treatment, so oxazorin, nafcillin, vanco, cephalosporins, um, and clinda. Now, unlike this one, though, for some reason, clinda, they have uh, the bacteria that causes this tends to have slightly higher clinda resistance. So you may not get as much benefit from clinda as you would with um, the previous one. Big thing, lots of insensible losses, fluid barriers broken, they're losing a lot of free water. Um, be very gentle when you're moving them because their skin is going to slough off if you're not careful. Um, and they need aggressive wound care. Next up, 46 year old male, super painful rash. He had a small bump on his inner thigh that he had scratched the day before. He has four to four sirs and looks like garbage. Those who can't hear that, we have the, the corner here mumbling neck fash. And it is neck fash. Um, so neck fash is usually a polymicrobial infection that involves the superficial fascial layers and then extends deeper into the fat and muscle layers. Like I said, usually polymicrobial usually will involve a Bacteroides clostridium or Peptostreptococcus, um, as well as an E. coli, Klebsiella type bacteria, and then some gram positives as well. Um, it rapidly progresses and can lead to sepsis and multi organ dysfunction pretty quickly. There's a higher risk in alcoholics, those who are immunocompromised, those who are diabetic, um, anyone with CKD, and then steroid use kind of goes into the immunocompromised. The big thing is time is of the essence. It starts out with just some mild nonspecific erythema and then can progress within hours. Um, if you guys haven't had a patient with neck fash, like in the ER, we will line their skin with it and then we will check on it hourly and can watch it get progressively worse in just an hour. Um, the pain will be out of proportion because the superficial skin findings don't portend how deep the infection actually goes deeply because it tends to migrate along the fascial planes before you ever get superficial involvement. Um, this is the time to pull out the big guns, either Zosin or Carbapenem, plus MRSA coverage with Vanco, plus Clinda, because again, it can help mediate toxin production. The big thing is that this needs surgery. The surgeon needs to come cut out the dead tissue and try to prevent infection. They will keep cutting until they get clean margins. Um, they will also send intraoperative gram cultures, gram stains and cultures, which will help guide your antibiotic therapy in the day or so that it takes to come back. This is a CT scan of someone who has gas in the sub-Q tissue. That's kind of the hallmark of a necrotizing infection. Um, it's usually the clostridium that's producing the gas. Next up, we got a 37 year old, no past medical history. He was started on Bactrim for a UTI and came in with fevers and flu-like symptoms. She is febrile, complaining of mouth pain, but the rest of her vital signs are okay. I heard an SJS. Correct. <laughs> I swear I'm not going to hit Dr. Alert. Promise. Um, so SJS and TEN or topic toxic toxic epidermal necrolysis is a spectrum based on size. Um, SJS involves less than 10% of the body area, full blown TEN is greater than 30%. And that in between, between 10 and 30%, they just call it SJS slash 10. We're really good at coming up with things. Um, there are a lot of, this is usually medication triggered, um, can also interestingly be triggered by mycoplasma. And up to a third of cases are idiopathic with no identifiable causes, which is kind of some of the common drugs that you will see come up both on boards and in real life, allopurinol, lamotrigine, sulfamethoxazole, and um, a lot of the anti-epileptics, a lot of the sulfonamides, phenobarb, a lot of the other antibiotics like doxy, cipro, rifampin, um, and interesting protonics and omeprazole, aka a lot of medications that we prescribe very frequently. Some of the risk factors, um, anyone with HIV or active cancer. There are certain HLA types, interestingly, not HLA B27, so I'm never gonna remember which HLA types there are. Um, lupus, and there is a relationship between the dosage of the drug and the likelihood of, of developing it. So higher dosages, more likely to develop. Um, we're still not entirely sure how the whole pathophys works for it. It involves um, a cytokine, Lytic protein called granulysin, which is made by T lymphocytes and a lot of the other first line inhibitor cells like NK cells and NKT cells. Um, there's also a role with IL-15, which I feel like we've all heard a lot more of in the COVID times. 
Um, and interestingly, IL-15 levels are correlated with disease severity. So if you have a super high IL-15 level, you're more likely to develop a more severe disease disease. And the hallmark on biopsy is a keratinocyte necrosis. So they start as erythematous macules that have that perpetic center. So I'm gonna go back to my picture so you can kind of see. You see how the centers are starting to turn a little bit purple on these? That's kind of the hallmark where it looks red and then the centers start to turn purple. Um, they also have this kind of bulla spread sign by some dude's name that I can't pronounce. Um, that basically when you push on the bulla, it will extend significantly, different than the Nikolsky's, but like just the bulla gets bigger when you push on it. And that's because the fascia layer or the layers are separating as you're doing it. Um, but they are Nikolsky positive if you push hard enough. And 90% of these will have mucosal involvement. So just like the hands and soles are important, mucosal involvement is important. If it has mucosal involvement, you're worried about it. Um, they have a very vague prodrome of just not feeling well. And then the rash rapidly progresses from just the erythematous macules into sloughing of the skin. They will then re-epithelialize and it typically takes about a week and a half for them to get better. Big problems are obviously super post-infection. You're losing your main barrier to the outside world. There's also massive fluid losses, which is why a lot of these patients should be transferred to a burn center if they have significant involvement. Um, the guy that we had in pod one that had it did get transferred to DMC for burns. I had a 17 year old in the ER who got it from some antibiotic and we also transferred them to the burn center. Um, other things is that it's all epithelial tracts that are sloughing, it's not just the external ones. So your GI tract, you can get sloughing, so you can get really severe mucositis, you can get esophagitis, and you get GI bleeds from all of the GI epithelium um, falling off. DIC has a 25% mortality if you're in full-blown 10, um, and can reoccur if you re-expose them to that offending agent. So make sure you put it on their allergy list if you identify a source. The treatment for it is really aggressive, basically supportive care. Wound care is a big thing, which is why they go to the different centers. There's gonna be a lot of fluid and nutritional management that you have to do. You have to give them lots of extra calories to make sure that they can re-epithelialize. It's very painful. Be nice, give them PCAs. Um, interestingly, one thing I wouldn't have thought of is if it's a woman, make sure a gynecologist comes and does a pelvic exam because that epithelium will also slough off and you can get really nasty adhesions. Um, there is, some thought that things like steroids and IDIG and plasmapheresis may help, but again, that's in the setting of it's presumed to be an immune reaction and maybe something that helps tamp in the immune system will help. The studies on it are kind of mixed. Um, the one that did have some promise was cyclosporin may slow the disease progression. All right. We have a 57 year old Jewish man who comes in with blistering of his mouth and skin, but he's otherwise feeling fine some drug exposures, normal vital signs. He looks pretty good aside from having lots of bulla on his body. A lot of mutterings of bulla sent quite on this throat. Yay, this is everybody. <laughs> Even if you didn't say anything, you get hit. <laughs> 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 I actually don't know how these strawberry kisses are. Cool. <laughs> Femphigus vulgaris. So this is an autoimmune reaction um, to the Desmoglean um, cell adhesions. Um, what you'll interestingly see on like microscopy is intracellular IgG depositions, which is what this lovely green picture is. It's been a long time since I've looked at slides like that, and I hope to not have to do it very often. Um, but it almost always has mucosal involvement. So SJS, Pemphigus vulgaris both have mucosal involvement. Um, the big difference is how sick they look. So Pemphigus vulgaris, they tend to have the flaccid bulla, but on very normal appearing skin otherwise. Um, and it too can cause widespread sloughing of the skin. Up to date has a fabulous algorithm on how to treat them based on um, how they're doing with treatment. So these first line therapy is steroids. It's not an immune reaction. Steroids make sense. Um, if they are a candidate for rituximab, um, rituximab is also used in conjunction with steroids and will help is usually done if they aren't steroid responsive or if they need more than just steroids. A lot of this has to do with 
if their disease is controlled or not. And what they define as controlled is basically the lesions that they already have aren't getting worse. They're not developing new lesions and everything's starting to heal. Um, if rituximab or steroids aren't working, you can use MMF or azathioprine as well. Last one, and then I promise we're just gonna get through some quick rashes and I will be done torturing you. All right, we got a 47 year old male also on Bactrim for a skin infection two weeks ago. Comes in with myalgias, he's got lymphedema, um, he's got fevers, a dry cough, and this lovely, lovely rash. He's got an elevated white count with eosinophilia, elevated lack LFTs. Okay. Money, money, microphone stay working. Okay. So DRESS stands for drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. I love acronyms, but this one's too long and you'll never remember if anything else is DRESS. Um, it is a T cell mediated hypersensitivity reaction. Um, it can either be drug related or potentially related to some of the herpes viruses. The most common one is HHV6. Most of them will have fevers with leukocytosis. Um, eosinophilia is kind of a hallmark feature, hence it being in the name. Um, and it will involve at least one other organ. The liver is the most common um, and usually has just some mildly elevated LFTs, but can progress to full blown liver, full -blown liver failure. Um, it can also involve the kidneys and that can be anywhere from just mild proteinuria like this drug case had, or it can be full blown renal failure as well. Lungs, they can get an interstitial pneumonitis type picture from it. Um, heart can get some myocarditis, and then they can get some neuropathy from it. It can be relapsing remitting, even if you res um, remove the drug. So they may have a recurrence of it a couple months later, even without, even without reintroduction. Um, a lot of the drugs that co cover that cause dress, you'll see, are somewhat similar to the ones that can cause SJS. Um, a lot of the antibiotics, things like linazolid, Bactrim, Banco, um, a lot of the anti seizure medications. Phenytoin is guilty of causing lots of different drug reactions. Um, antidepressants like fluoxetine, which a lot of people are on, and then allopurinol and so is kind of common among both, as well as um, Rylosec. This is how you diagnose it. Um, this is also an up-to-date stolen graph, but basically you're looking for some of the same things we already talked about. So you're usually febrile. Um, they usually have some degree of lymphedema. They have eosinophilia, and you will kind of see some atypical lymphocytes on the purple smear. Skin rashes, you can do a biopsy, which is what the patient I had on what B1 that we did. We actually had the derm come do a biopsy that confirmed it. Um, and then other organ involvement, it lasts a long time, like unlike some of the other reactions. So greater than two weeks tends to point more towards this than something like SJS, which usually in two weeks, you'll either be dead or getting a lot better. Um, and then you've kind of ruled out some of the other things. Um, so if you have greater than six points, it's confirmed. Um, four to five is most likely, two to three is possible. And then if it's less than two, you pretty much don't have to ask. Treatment is to stop the offending agent. Um, if there's severe disease, relapsing, remitting disease, or if they have significant pulmonary involvement, um, steroids and it's 0.5 to one meg per day of prednisone a day. If steroids don't work or they can't be on steroids for some reason, cyclosporin is a second line. Most patients will recover just fine, but it can take a long time. And like I said, it can be relaxing. Are you guys feeling a little bit PowerPointed to death? At this point, when I was making this, I was feeling very PowerPointed to death and I was the one making it. So we're going to do some quick fun just to use up the rest of my kisses and maybe pelt some of you in the face with some chocolate. So we're going to see a rash and you're just going to name the disease. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Hopefully this works.
Any idea? All right. This is serum sickness. To me, it looks like erythema migrans, but without the central query. Um, so serum sickness is usually characterized by a rash, polyarthralgias, lymphadenopathy, usually one to two weeks post-exposure. Um, there's a difference between true serum sickness and serum sickness-like reaction. True serum sickness is typically only a response to snake bites, insect bites, or monoclonal antibody infusions. Um, and then the like reaction is drug-mediated or viral infection-mediated. Yeah, small little raised bumpies. Should have given more clues <laughs> in hindsight. Close, yeah, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I really just want to throw one at Dr. Alert. <laughs> oh, almost the two handed catch. <clears throat> So this is what Rocky Mountain spotted fever looks like. It looks a lot like measles to me. Um, and that's kind of on the differential when you see a rash like this. Um, it's caused by rickettsia. It's a tick-borne illness, not usually seen in Michigan, but can be. They will basically have constitutional symptoms, headache in most of them, this rash, um, and then thrombocytopenia with some LFT elevation. Big thing is the rash actually comes three to five days after the start of symptoms, and you don't want to wait for the rash to start treatment. So if you have a story that's convincing for maybe a tick-borne illness, um, just start Doxy. Doxy will treat the vast majority of tick-borne illnesses. Um, so if you have someone who was hiking recently or found a tick attack and now has a headache, just go ahead and start them on Doxy because it can rapidly progress to pretty, system pretty, system pretty serious systemic symptoms and infection. This one's not a trick question. We've all seen this rash. Oh, we've all had this rash. Hives, urticaria. <laughs> Which is a type one hypersensitivity reaction. Similar to one that you had earlier in this. In the, you guys gotta talk about it. I can't hear you over my mask. Um, college kid now feels like crap and is complaining that his head is killing him. <laughs> yeah. That's the one of those terrifying rashes where you hope to never see it because we're gonna be finding kisses in this room <laughs> for weeks. Weeks, I tell you. Okay. Really gross, black escar. Pyoderma ganger enough is a good guess. Um, Khalid should see this patient all the time. Yeah, calciflaxis, yeah. Um, which is caused by calcium deposition within the vessel walls that then cause micro or micro thrombosis and infarcts, which then looks like this. Take home points. We're done with pictures, yay. Um, know how to describe your rash to your dermatologist because a lot of these you're going to look at and go that doesn't look good but I don't entirely know why it doesn't look good so kindly dermatologist will you please come bless me with your great skincare regimen and help me with the skin biopsy um watch for bola pretty much most of the bolus diseases are no bueno because they tend to result in a lot of skin sloughing mucosal involvement is never a good sign in general um and then rashes can be some clues to some underlying diseases and hopefully by the end of this, you now know some of the life-threatening rashes and kind of daily what they look like. And this is definitely how all of us feel when the dermatologist asks you what to describe the rash. You'll be like, I'll just send you a picture. So there's a lot of references, but my Google image search is a scary place right now. Um, I really hope that nobody ever looks at my computer. And the adage in emergency medicine has always been if it's dry, keep it wet, and if it's wet, keep it dry. Well, that kind of goes for a lot of rations. But... Any questions, comments, concerns?
not that I heard of. No one asked if any of our monoclonal antibody infusionists got any reactions. Which is already done, Daniel. <laughs> Lyme disease. Yep. The interesting thing about a lot of those is the answer is doxy even in kids. You guys don't see kids, so it doesn't really matter that much, but if you ever go somewhere where you have to see a kid, it's doxy even in kids. You risk the teeth stainage for the life savingness. Did you learn something? So for SJS, can we use uh, the Parkland? Same Parkland formatting for estimating the body temperature? You probably can. Parkland is technically only verified in the burns, but you treat them the same. It's essentially a burn because you've lost all of your epidermis. All right, thanks audience that is at home in their pajamas or in the office doing actual work.